once again, thank you. So with this, those formalities out of the way, we would like to now hear from you. And just to give you some of the ground rules for your contributions this evening, before you come to the microphone, and there are two of them on the floor, to give your contribution, we ask you to please state your name and indicate the general area you're from. You have a five-minute time limit to make your contribution. Now, if we are, everybody got, gets their chance to make their contribution and we still have time on the schedule, you could probably come back up and make another point. But please, to give everybody an opportunity to make a contribution this evening, please, we will be limiting you to five minutes per contribution. We also ask that you please stay away from any political comments or any comments of bias. And if you need any clarification on the Constitution, the members of the head table will be able to step in and assist. But really, it's to hear from you. So we are now ready, and I would like to ask you to please come forward to the microphone. First come, first serve, basically, to make your contribution. And do start by introducing yourself and telling us where you're from. Good evening, sir. Good evening, my name is Satnarain Maranj from Kuva. My first contribution is our electoral process. An electoral process should be designed to reflect the will of the population, the will of the country. The current system does not reflect that. What you could see typically might be a minority government. And that probably is one of the reasons why people are not voting. If you have a million electorate eligible to vote, then I think the Constitution should be amended to reflect the majority of the electorate who should be in government. That is typical of the country. Next thing that is of very importance, utmost importance, is that we are seeing daily our independent institutions are being seriously eroded. By whom? Those who have been sworn to protect the very constitution. Typical example, as some of the moderators were saying before, let us look at the current embroilgo with the Auditor General. That office is constitutionally protected and should be advised by the Attorney General I have not seen nowhere in the Constitution where the Attorney General must give advice to the Finance Minister. I have perused the document. What the Finance Minister should have done, lay the report in Parliament. No, he said he has given advice that is outside of the Constitution. We saw a next example again about the Police Service Commission. Where a high office holder went to the president house, what was the duty as, as by the constitution was to forward that, that recommendation to the parliament for it to be dealt there. That was being eroded. We had probably, they said no biases, but this is not biases. The police service commission, they have the rear whistle the technical expertise when they are assessing a commissioner. Lo and behold, that was just trampled upon by our high office holder who have been sworn to protect. Another point I'm saying, you have the government consists of the, the government side, the opposition side. It's like two adversaries in a courthouse. You have a judge who must not be biased must listen to the argument. The system we have in place is that the current speaker is a creature of the government. Would they be so bold to go against the government? I have seen it in other governments. Mr. Mohammed was a speaker. I have seen in the past where a speaker in the partnership government voted with the opposition. Then again, we must have a different system Imagine a speaker telling a member of parliament who we have elected, take a walk. Who is it they speaking to? A little child? When a member speaks in parliament is to represent the views of the people who elected them and they are being shut in and put it out of parliament. The speaker does not put them in parliament, it's the electorate put them in parliament. 
Next thing, the president should have been a person elected by the people. It must not be a creature of the government. Next thing, you know time is limited, I said. Independent senators. I am not against nobody. Are they really truly independent? Who created them? Who appointed them? They are appointed by the president. Who appoints the president? The government. That is why on critical issues, everyone is singing for their supper. Everyone is singing for their supper. They are not dealing with the issues. And my last point, sir, look at the panel. I am seeing nothing but biasness. Why can't I see people like Ramesh Deusaran, John Laguerre, all as I'm seeing, and I'm saying as I'm seeing, are political appointments. Who would they take for the people? I'm saying it without fear. And this is the problem we have. This is the problem. I don't want to go further. Th thank you, Mr. Maraj. Thank you for your contribution. Good evening, sir. Please introduce yourself. Good day. My name is Abzal Mohammed, and I live at Bukawajas, Makpinye. Yeah, my first point is dealing with the cabinet. The cabinet of this country concerns deals with the prime minister and the attorney general. Why it is that we must have a prime minister who would appoint a senator to be our attorney general to make the laws of the country? Why it is not that the attorney general should not be elected and not selected? I totally against that. This is the third time I've come into this conference. The first time I've been in the cabinet, I was a um, senior sex school, there were junior sex that time, then Shogonas with Mr. Ramada, and here today. And if some of my points don't come out, I will rally for people, do not attend these sort of meetings, because they just take them, and I will assume, put them on a shelf, and leave them there, and the people don't get it. I must say I admire Dr. Shavil's speech, and if you put that into practice in this um, meeting here, I think we would, we would be a better place today. Because you cannot have the Attorney General being selected by the Prime Minister. He's a creature of the Prime Minister. I think that is totally wrong. My next point is, the President. We either have a President or a Prime Minister. Because you cannot have a President doing the same thing what the Prime Minister is doing because the President always go on the advice of the Prime Minister to sign all the papers and all these sort of things. One between the two. Either you have a president or you have a prime minister. And also, I think, if you want to have a president, they also should be elected and not selected. Because when they are being selected, they are in the winds and pharmacy of the people who rules the government at that time. Then you have the Speaker of the House. You have the Speaker of the House, a person who I think also should be elected and not selected. Why they should be selected? to put there to go in favor of who. If I am being given my job by somebody, I have to go according to the rules and fancy of them. So I think if they have been elected, we will have a better country and a better government to run the place of Trinidad and Tobago. My next point is the Police Service Commission. Why it is that the Prime Minister must make the final decision to say who should be the Police Service Commissioner? No, the Police Service Commission should appoint the Commissioner of Police and not the Prime Minister of the last say. There it is again, an ex -quitter. Because the Prime Minister have all the say in this country, whether it is Kamla, whether it is Pan, eh, eh, Mr. Rowley. Because IT personally think that is wrong. They have to, when it goes out to, elect you, to, to get them to vote for you, they will tell you all the nice things. And when they get there, they don't even want to hear you. And I also think that we should have two terms, the American system, for all politicians, whether you're the prime minister or whether you're a member of parliament. Two terms for all of them. And after these two terms finish, you come back after two terms. You are not there for 20, 30, and 40 years. Is that a job? That is not a job. The people elect you to put you there. And you should not be there for 10, 15, and 20 years. I totally against that. And that's how it is in this country. That's why the, the parliamentarian there would do anything they want against the people. They never fought the people except during the election time. These are some of my points that I think 
that will help us if we really want to, to see that Trinidad become a better place. But I don't think we would be better because you said don't talk about the politics. But these 41 politicians we have here, I don't think they are good for this country at all, at all, at all. That is my opinion. I could be wrong. That is why I'm saying two terms for them. So when you have two terms, you get somebody else new. Because you see, member of parliament, yeah, all the time, all the time, from time to time, you could definitely, anybody could select and say who it is going up here and who going up here and who put it. Because we have 16 safe seats on both sides of the fence. Yeah. And when we look at it in that issue, I personally think that some of these points that I have made here, if we try and put it into practice, it may not be right. It may not be wrong. But definitely, we will have a better cabinet. We will have a better um, government into force. And maybe that we might get a better country. Because this country had too much money, and they don't have now. They have too much money and misappropriation of the money by the government ministers on both sides of defense. That is why we are seeing all this trouble in Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you ever so much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Mohammed, for your contribution. So we invite anyone else? So good evening. Please introduce yourself. Mr. Chairman and members of the head table, I am Gerald Peters. I live just down the street in Point Lisas. I have a few comments I would like to make to the panel and those in attendance. Uh, one of my recommendations is that we should have a president to replace the prime minister. A president with all powers of governance and a fixed term of office. One who would not walk around and say that they have a, the election date in their back pocket, but it should be a four-year term, and as the previous speaker said, two consecutive four-year term, and then you demit office. Secondly, I would I'd like to recommend that a dole be given to every one over the age of 18 who is not working as a citizen of the country. My third point, compulsory community service of one year for all persons on the island between the ages of 16 to 25 years. You must give community service if you are citizen of a country. So they have within the period between the 16 years of age to 25 to give back to the country. I, my fourth point, a maximum of 2 to 5% of workforce must include persons with disability. Not because you have a disability, you sit home and, you know. I've, I work at the Ministry of Health for many years and where you have a clerical officer without legs on a wheelchair, a very efficient worker. So having a one limb does not debar you from being a productive individual in this day and age. I know that we have a law that every father should pay child support until that child is 18. That is not really seriously addressed in Trinidad. I would like that, that to be seriously addressed with proof of paternity by a DNA testing. Men must not just have children and the government have to mind those children. Find the men and let them support their children. I've, I uh, believe that imprisonment for for men who impregnate children under 18 years. We still have that taking place in Trinidad in 2024. Children appearing at our hospital, 14 years, 15 years, 16 years, making babies. And the men go free. My seventh point recognition and favor for all members of the protective services and nurses. And 
they should receive preferential treatment in public offices as take place in the US and other countries, plus saying we should develop a culture when we are survey, when we see these persons, these individuals, say thank you for your service. We are not a, a very thankful society. My eighth point, corrupt individuals must repay twice the amount of goods that have been stolen. Ninth, I would like to see that the national anthem be sung or played in every gathering daily, including the schools. We need to take pride in our country. Number 10, nothing must be free in the country. If it means paying a $1 because you're retired and you want to be on the public service bus, you pay $1. We have gotten into a culture where everything must be free. I had the good fortune of being the national epidemiologist in Trinidad before I retired. I went to Dutch St. Martin where I work as the first national epidemiologist. There is no free service there. No free health center, no free hospital. No problem, no quarrel. People's attitude change when they have to pay. Justice must be swift and appear untainted in Trinidad. We have a serious, I have the last point. I strongly recommend a four day work week where you have Wednesday off and Saturday and Sunday. This operates in Dutch St. Martin. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. My name is Patrice Daisy, I'm from Coover. My, I'm listening to the constitution reform and I'm trying to figure out how many of it have been implemented from then to now. And I agree with what they say that every minister is supposed to have two terms. And my thing is this is that government agency, all of them, is that you go over them you call one person about a problem, they say yes. You call somebody else with the same problem, they tell you something else. It's like left hand does not know what right hand is doing in the government or any agency we have in this country, and that's a problem. And all the ministers who go up on a platform and promise us a lot of stuff, I think that whatever they promise, they're supposed to keep it. And if you can't keep it, you should be accountable for that. Because you go around and you say, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that, and at the end of the day, we get nothing, and you guys get our vote, and we get nothing in return. And that's not good. Another thing is, the crimes that we've seen in the country, I find that it have a lot, we're supposed to have a law that states, if a child is being abused, from the, the, the adult, the male, whoever it is, and the woman in the family who knows about it, she's supposed to be held accountable also. Because a lot of times they lock up the men, but nothing happens to the woman. And the woman's supposed to be the protector of their child. And nobody puts the blame on the woman, and that's supposed, we're supposed to do that. So we need to have something that states that if a child is in a home and that child is being abused and one parent know and the other parent doesn't say anything, the parent who does not do anything is supposed to be held accountable. Not, we're not supposed to feel sorry for that parent. We're supposed to hold that parent accountable for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Patrice, for your contribution. Let's wait one sec, let them adjust the height. Good evening. Okay. Evening. My name is Cheryl Green. I'm from Ivy School, Lisa's Gardens. I have four points here, some of which were already stated. Um, 
The first one has to do with election date. I believe we should have a fixed date for election, and it shouldn't be according to women fancy. Whether it's four years or five years, it doesn't matter, but it should be a set date. I also think that we should have term limits for government officers. You shouldn't be in office for 10, 15, 20 years, you know. After a while, it really doesn't make sense. My third point has to do, somebody talked about community service, and I believe that it should be an integral part of our education system. I think that for graduation, a student should have performed some amount of community service, whether it's high school, high school or university, in order to graduate. That's the only way we will get people committed to Trinidad and Tobago and seeking the welfare of Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, just to state my annoyance, I was driving down the road, the back road in Coover, and I'm seeing all these piles of garbage that people just took from their homes and they piled up through wherever. I mean, as a human being, you have to have pride in your country, pride in your community, and people have to be taught these things. And my final point, I need to ask a question. The Privy Council, it's part of our constitution, is it? Personally, I think it's time that we need to change. Um, we have to, at some point, have to develop our systems. We have to have faith in our system. We have to have faith in the people to be objective, to be honest, and to judge, fail, quote, whatever that may be. And it shouldn't be, I think one person said, it should, um, ICJ should be representative of the population. The ICJ should be representative of the people who are qualified to do the job, regardless of who or what they are. And I think that's about it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cheryl, for your contribution, for your points made. Anyone else? Yes, good evening, sir. Please give us your name and Hi, location. Good Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anthony Da Costa. I am from Faisabad. I missed the one down Faisabad, so I came to this. Using the, 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 the mic in front here, just for my sake, I am getting a muffled um, with that mic in the back. Okay, no problem. And I would really like to hear you. Thank, thank you very much. All right, yes, good afternoon again. My name is Anthony Da Costa, and I am from Faisabad. I would like to start by um, defining the word democracy. And it's a Greek word to, that's two parts. Demos, which means people, and kratos, that means power. Simply put, it's power of the people. And I would start with my first point. Legislation for party financing. This is one of the main things that affect equality in our country and erodes democracy. So, as, so at this point, we don't see power to the people, but power to a person or a group of individuals. Simply put, democracy based on the present system that we have is for sale by the highest financier. A fixed date for elections. Some of our citizens have also mentioned that. <clears throat> One person knowing the election date, or should I say one person who knows the election date could never be democratic. The right to recall MPs, self-explanatory. Continuity of projects from previous administration must be continued and completed and used for the purpose it was made for. Too many times we have seen taxpayers' dollars invested in 
millions and billions of dollars in projects, and when a new administration comes, it is forgotten. And it's, it's sometimes, when they do finish it, it is not used for the purpose it was created for. So we'd like to see that. Um, any foreign contractor doing business in Trinidad must have a minimum of 60% of its staff filled with local content. Right now, we could take a page out of Guyana's book with that. They, if you're going to do business in Guyana, they would like to have a, somebody in their country who owns most of the shares in that company, country. may not be the method we may use, but I would like to see when we have mega projects going on in this country that it is not fully staffed by Chinese workers or any other foreign country. Citizens must always have the control majority in all assets belonging to Trinidad and Tobago. MSME businesses to be taxed under a different corporation tax bracket. Reason being, for small startups, we are, always, we are taxed the same way as big companies are taxed. And if we're really serious about SMEs or MSMEs, which is micro, we should, not, we should have a separate tax bracket for them to be able to function in and be able to grow their businesses. A proper system to ensure that government, the government of the day, pays, it bills, pays its bills on time. All right, so I will expand on this. For example, one of the functions of the OPR is to keep the vendor in check with all their statutory obligations. I would also like to see an effective system put in place, just like how the OPR is automated to flag documents when they are close to their expiry dates, example, VAT and tax clearance certificates. There should be a system in which after the agreed date of payment is not met, the customer slash government institution is flagged and made aware of the interest to be paid to the vendor. I have done work for the government. I have suffered under the government as well, waiting for payments for over nine months. That almost crippled my business. And that is not fair to business people who offer their services and time to the government. Business chambers to have a set, uh, to business chambers to have a seat at the table when policy, when piloting bills and decisions that would affect businesses. Example, change in the $100 note, forex distribution, customs and excise, um, the protection of small businesses from conglomerates. And number 10, regulation in the music industry. We have seen some of our local artists being banned in other countries because of the content that they have in their music. And for some reason or the other, we are not taking it serious here in Trinidad. And I'm saying that when these guys are going out there to commit crimes, they are not listening to Celine Dion and, and other, other artists. They are listening to violent music to propel themselves to continue doing what they're doing. So we need to have some regulation. And to end, the lack of implementation of constitutional reform continues to be an indictment for the successive failures we have been experiencing as a country. Simply put, we cannot do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Anthony, for your points, for your contributions. It's good evening. So can you come to the front microphone, just so that we hear you a little bit clearer? Just give us your name again and your location. A pleasant good evening to the head table. My name is Gilbert Egan. I reside at a Point Lisa School for Housing. My contribution this evening would stem from a thought that has always been bugging me in my mind, and it has to do with the effects of lack of awareness and the law. Awareness and the law, and this is what most of our people crave for. 
which is so important as enshrined in our constitution. Yes? Because the leaflet that I received this evening sp said specifically that the constitution provides the laws that protect our rights and the rules that govern those in public life. Those that govern us in public life. We have systems as Dr. Farrell had hinted before, reasons why they fail. So we are all operating in a failed system. The system has broken down. I have before me here a working document of since 2009. We've been grappling with this whole issue of constitution reform and nothing seems to be coming forward. So I pray this day that from this meeting, this, this should be the final meeting as to determining whether we go or we just go lawless. And I think it stems from the, the, the understanding of the importance of accountability when you're in public office. Accountability. Trust. Confidence. And of course, corrective measures. You can't have people holding political office doing as they want. That is not enshrined in the rights and the freedoms of the people. And as a matter of fact, the Constitution doesn't speak about that. We can all say we've been viewing on our television sets what has been taking place in the great north of, in the United States of America and take a pattern out of that. You are not beyond the law. So sometime, as to deal with myself, sometime in 2013, Yours truly retired from my employer, which was Petrotrend. And it was not somewhere down in 2018 that a good gentleman holding a state office as prime minister closed down an enterprise without I having to make a contribution since I was totally affected by the directions. That should not be. And I can say from where I sit and where I've been looking on, the country is grieving mercilessly as a result of that action. That has been a one-man action from where I sat as an employee looking in at the whole scenario. Then we have this situation where we ask for the involvement of the young people. I recognize um, Dr. Farrell because I would have come across Dr. Farrell many years when he was a much younger man to himself and Trevor. And I remember them being brought forward by um, Mr. George Weeks in the OW2. They were young men. Where are the young people now to serve the country who are educated to that level? They're not coming forward. What is causing that? We need to find out where they are and why is it that they are not, they're not, they're not inveigled into the politics of Trinidad and Tobago. So as for political parties, that is where the problem is. The system, the poor system is how we, how we, we share the, 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 the party finances. Very important, the party finances. I supposed to be in a situation if, if I have the, or where it all and I have the, the, the resources to, to set up a, a, a political party, then what is given to it's supposed to be given to all parties that have that come on the, you know, that, that um, they, they have that provision there. That should be spelled out to give people equity and to give more involvement and so on, more participation. Local government. That is a soul in our heart. To me, it's, it's, it's the ministry that is ineffective. It's not working. There are many people who can say, as I have said, have made several reports to some of the regional corporations in months, some of the years, no actions. And then nobody comes to account or say what is the reasons and so on. So we don't hear. But yet the taxpayers' money is going 
to sustain the, 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 industry, the, the ministries. So all of these, uh, these are some of my points that I had presented this evening that I hope your committee will take into consideration as we plan forward for the reforming of the Constitution. I thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your contribution. I know this gentleman in front has been trying to get to the microphone, so let's give him a chance, and then the lady at the back, you can come after. Yeah, my presentation is seven minutes. Do you want me to wait till the end, or...? Let's see how much of it we can get through, and then if you need to pause and come back. Okay. We don't have a huge audience, so maybe we could give you these seven minutes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Dr. John Gedeon, and I'm from St. Joseph, up by Curup, and I retired from UE in 2017. Right. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank the panel. Um, I don't envy you for your work going all around the country, and this is your... 13th session here, and I want to thank you for all your effort here. What I'd like to talk about tonight is um, making our country a truly secular country. And in the words of our national anthem, every creed and race finds an equal place. Our story begins with the idea that some creeds in Trinidad and Tobago have, in fact, not found an equal place. How big is our group? The 2011 census on religion showed the category of none or none stated accounted for 12% of our population, which is over an 800% increase since 2000. So there are a lot of non-believers in our nation looking for an equal place and their numbers are growing as church membership declines. But first we must define what a creed means. And I would say it's either a religion or a philosophy of life to broaden the definition. My philosophy is humanism. In short, that means that we do not believe in God or gods, heaven or hell, or the supernatural in general. We do, however, believe in leading ethical lives, human rights, and the progress of mankind by using science and reason instead of scriptures. Our Bible only has one sentence, and you can see it on my t-shirt. I'll put it over for the camera. And it says, sorry. It says, the world is my country, all men are my brothers, and to do good is my religion. Further, non-believers get married, they have children, they have need of funeral services. And so in that sense, we are a community or a creed and they cannot find these ceremonies in a church without uh, God being invoked. Therefore, our creed takes care of those life cycle ceremonies and educational needs and is done by a humanist celebrant, which is the equivalent to a religious clergy. And I am one such certified celebrant. On that topic, I am not legally recognized for form marriage here, but I am in the United States. There have been the Christian Marriage Act in 1923, the Hindu Act in 45, the Muslim Act in 61, and the Orisha Act in 99 to allow only God-fearing officiants to conduct these ceremonies. But non-believers cannot find an equal place here either. But we offer something that religions cannot, and that is a same-sex marriage, as we are not prejudiced against the community by any scriptures. So what's our recommendation? If you are ordained or certified by an international creed group, whether it's God-fearing or not, then you can apply for a license to conduct marriages in Trinidad and Tobago. We still have blasphemy laws on our books. The first one was 1844. So you thought, well, that's ancient history, right? But in 2000, they, they have another act that um, that finds ridiculing contempt or disbelief of God as a punishable offense. These laws need to be removed as we find ourselves secondary and, not, and don't have an equal place here too. The last set of points deal with the separation of church and state, which has served the US well for over almost 250 years. To be fair, I have to say that TNT is doing a good job in terms of freedom of religion to follow whatever one's conscience decides 
and the government is mostly neutral in terms of endorsing any particular re religion. But the government subsidizes religious activities, provides property, and gives special tax breaks that other NGOs do not enjoy. Humanists think that this money is better spent on education, health, and security needs, and therefore this special treatment should be terminated. To make the Constitution truly neutral, as they do in the US, Spain, and Italy, we need to remove any reference to God or religion. Chapter 1 currently reads, Trinidad and Tobago is founded upon the principles that acknowledge the supremacy of God. And a further passage that says the inalienable rights which all members of the human family are endowed by their creator. The Pledge of Allegiance states, I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of God. We non-believers only pledge allegiance to our country, not to any god. Again, we're not equal here either. The national anthem is also not neutral and talks about prayer and may God bless our nation. We find it surprising that God would favor one country over another in handing out blessings. In terms of public education, we do not support prayer or religious instruction in public schools as it discriminates against non-believers. We do, however, support the study of comparative religion and religiously neutral character building programs. There are a few other areas for discussion and those are contained on my online submission that I, I submitted in April. So all we're asking for is to find an equal place in this modern world and move towards a truly secular state where religion can be practiced in the church and at home, but not in the public sphere. Can we live up to the words in our national anthem, which unfortunately could now be translated as, only the creeds that believe in God can find an equal place? Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. So we now invite our dear sister from the back to come forward. Good evening. Give us your name, please, and your location you're coming from. I first want to thank uh, the panel. I think that this is my Let's name. Give us first. your name, yes. Sorry. I'm Lindy Way Kamau. I was born in California in the neighborhood, but I live abroad. So um, it's a, a the such, I'm extremely grateful that this panel has been convened because I'm in touch with a lot of expats in the United States because I'm a community activist at this point in my life. And so many people want to return like myself. I'm here temporarily taking care of an aged parent, 96 years old. So I'm back and forth. I'm involved in a lot of community service here because it's what I do. And some things came forward. Number one, I have never been an adult in Trinidad, so I don't know the Constitution. This is an attempt to inform and educate me. So forgive me if whatever I have to say is not part of this particular agenda. But what I... Of course, I was very, very moved that so many people have spoken about term limits. It's one of the things that I've often, and in my last, latest experience, I can see why the lack of term limits does not work. Number one, the young people are never given a chance. It's what they do in the United States. Congress is made up I would say more Senate, made up of old men because there's no term limits. And when there are term limits, people are forced, even for their history, their reputation, whatever, they're only there for a couple years, they have to prove themselves. So that I think is extremely important. 
what I've experienced in my couple months that I visit is that our elected officials do not live, it's not a requirement that they live in the same areas that they represent. I see my own city council person walking the streets and if I, I'm a community activist and there's a sanitation problem, she's walking going home and I can stop her and say, look at this. When I try to do community work here, it's not the same. And to me, that is very impactful. So I would say people, elected officials, in order, it's a criteria for them to live in the community that they serve. So that's part of what my contribution is. I also would like to speak about ballot proposals. What I find is that a lot of the laws, and I'm happy that some um, you guys have explained why some of the laws are so archaic. It's because several attempts have been made. What we do in the United States in the context of the election, you have your ballot proposals. So you have some nonprofit organizations like the League of Voters that actually educate and inform you in communications, and they bring forward laws as part of the ballot process. So you vote for people on one side, you turn the page, and there are ballot proposals changing some of these laws. So the laws remain updated. So the stuff that I go through while I'm here, and I see why expats have a problem, is that I come through the airport and the customs and certain things. Um, my grandson couldn't wear some um, the, the camouflage, a gray and white camouflage. He's five years old. They want me to take office, and I'm like, where in the public domain do the people who live abroad understand this? They, they, they do it abroad, and they come home, and they tell me that he has to take his pants off, and what have you. Very bad experience for tourists, I must say. So things like that become updated. I don't know the difference between the Constitution and how laws are made here. But I think those kinds of stuff have been places where I have to have sleeves on. I can't retrieve my shipment because I have sandals on. Those kinds of stuff is what I'm talking about. So I, it's not being derogatory to say that they are okay, but they are okay. Because nobody tells you, and you think of tourists, you think of people who want to come back home. And they're like, really? I can't go to see my father in the hospital because I don't have sleeves. I think it has been updated, but I'm, I'm just using this as a reference. So those are the kinds of things that I um, love to talk about. Um, one of the things that bothers me also, which may be a part of the Constitution, is the role of the regiment. And um, in a situation where there's all, all this crime, I imagine it's the Constitution that says they cannot come forward and help protect the people but I believe that this is something they should be. So I thank you guys for my time, for your time. Thank you very much for your contributions and the points made this evening. So we invite anyone else who would like to share, please come forward. I right, just give us your name and your location you're coming from. Keval Marimutu, I live in Cuba. Now, just as a funny statement, um, I took umbrage with um, the comment you made talking about the content of our contributions. You said to avoid political statements, but everything we are discussing today is inherently political. Um, but I myself will not be going into party politics, nor will I be making any statements I deem to be politic. Um, statements I consider to be controversial. Right. A government should represent the people. 
A constitution more so should be based on the unique circumstances on the society it intends to govern. Our constitution, specifically the systems of election, is uniquely ill-suited to the circumstances that exist in a multicultural Trinidad and Tobago. First past the post systems work well or reasonably well in homogenous societies, but the system breaks down when you apply it to multicultural societies. Now, I'm sure I'm rehashing um, comments, contributions you've previously heard in other sessions. Right. Apathy is rampant in Trinbagonian politics. If did not vote was a political party, the last election it would have won. But why is this so? The most common complaints levied against our political system is that politics is oppositional and racialized. But that is inherent in the first past the post system in a multicultural society, where groups are formed based on the most conspicuous characteristic, in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, this being race. If we want to create a system that empowers the electorate and is conducive to productivity and evolution, we need to move towards a system of proportional representation. This move will remove the stigma attached to third parties, that being that the spoiler label or the belief that a vote for a third party is a, is a wasted vote. No vote should be considered wasted in a democracy, but that is the reality of the current system that prevails. Proportional representation advocates, may I say forces collaboration among political parties, something that is sorely lacking in Trinidad and Tobago. It will limit the ability of a single party to govern, but ensures that if a party can govern alone, it is supported by a majority of the voting population. Proportional representation promotes political participation, especially so by those that are apathetic to the current system, something that could only be a positive. If we want positive change, the political culture needs to evolve. The only way that this can happen is through some form of proportional representation, whether it be mixed member, party list, or another variation. Now, this is just something I quickly wrote there. I'm actually was disappointed that um, the period for submissions, written submissions, closed so early. But um, <laughs> that's besides the point. Now, um, how much time do I have again? All right, so I know there's a story you all know of. I will, should know of, I believe. Um, well, I think it was Mr. Pandey was talking about proportional representation in regards to George Chambers. And he said that Chambers was in favor of it, but other members in the party was asking him, well, you're forming a government right now. Why would you want to move to a system that limits your ability to form a government? And I think that is something that we need to take into consideration. I mean, no offense to this commission, but it was set up by a government that does not, that won up an election by a plurality of votes. In essence, it is not representative of the majority of people in Trinidad and Tobago. And then we need to look at why the two political parties in the current system would want to change the system that has allowed them to dominate politics for the last, well, since the inception of the Constitution. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your contribution. So do we have anyone else who would like to contribute this evening? Just remember to give us your name, please. Good night, everyone. I am Michelle Yatali Haridas. I am from Dow Village, South Oropoch, and this is my contribution. The Constitution should be part of the educational system from primary to secondary schools at varying levels. Oh, sorry. Our education syllabus should include programs for social awareness so that our children will be able to learn and understand social responsibilities. Sole traders should be able to contribute to NIS. Our constitution should also reflect on our respect and care for our disabled and aging citizens. Some ways I suggest that we go about to achieve this is that healthcare workers uh, should be visiting for um, more long-term care facilities, for example, disabled, disabled centers and homes for the age. We must do more on the educational path where of awareness for dis disability, 
Alzheimer's, and dementia. Families should be able to access counseling dealing with these challenges. Regular prices or subsidies on drugs to treat with these areas would be a great help. Lack of pharmaceuticals in the public health care system resulting in pharmacies only opening in one or two days a week, sometimes even half day per week. This may also make these victims easy to criminal elements. Regulate our food prices so that people could afford healthy living and affordable prices. Thank you very much for your contribution. So the floor is open once again. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Barclay. I live in Chagonas. I'm a pastor. For all that we have talked about here, beginning with uh, hearing from uh, Dr. Farrell when I walked in, and the several attempts that have been uh, made to improve or to make amendments to the Constitution, they all speak about, one, the necessity for honesty or the desire for fairness. We talked about the principles of fairness committee. We talked about um, the integrity commission legislation. All of those things seek to uh, bring honesty or integrity to the table. That's what they do. As a pastor, I can tell you that the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17 and verse 9, tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked. It is deceitful above all things. And if that is what God has to say about the heart of man, I believe that that is what is true. And that is why we are in the conundrum that we find ourselves. In that event, all that we will do via reform or amendments and so on, would continually seek to challenge men's hearts' deceitfulness continually. And therefore, if you are to make an attempt to improve, we say we want democracy, somebody described what it is, government for, by, and off the people. And if we are to move in that direction more perfectly. I think about a constituency management tool or matrix, as you may want to call it. So somebody gets elected and he is in charge of the constituency. And you don't see him until the next five years. Some, people's, some people advocate four years. Whatever the period, the thing about it is you want to keep them honest to the extent that you can. How do you do that? They walk around under the promise that they would fix this and fix that and so on. But a year after they have come and received your votes, you don't see them. And you don't see anybody related to their work or what they had promised. And therefore, I believe what could be done in a case such as that is we can very easily employ some people to go through the constituencies as they are designed. 
every constituency has a thousand people, whatever the number is, uh, 500 homes, we know all the streets. Who goes through those streets after the representatives pass? Whether they are in government or out of government, it doesn't matter. But somebody should go back through those constituencies, street by street, house by house, identify, of course the census, the census does something, like that, but that's every 10 years. And there are two periods of governing that would exist within that, that census period. But go through the constituency. And in going through that constituency, it is easy to find the children that should be in school and are not. It is easy to find the drains that need to be cleared and are not. Because those are the, the needs of the people, government of, by, and for the people. It is easy to find the blocks that have drugs in it. And all of that information can be retrieved and returned to the relevant quarters to have those things addressed. I believe that if we can manage our constituencies, even at a micro level, we have a good start in keeping our politicians honest. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your contribution, for your ideas and your thoughts there. So once again, the floor is open. We invite anyone who would like to make a contribution. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Kavita Davidin from Pinal. Um, <clears throat> so some of my points this evening, continuing from the last day in Superior. Um, legislations to regulate bank charges, as it's incredibly overwhelming, the amount of fees that citizens pay at banking institutions. In light of digitalization, customers have to pay high transaction fees. Small business owners have to pay exorbitant fees for the use of debit and credit card machines, as well as the customer is charged for transactions. Therefore, for one card transaction, cashless transaction that we're moving to, it costs a customer between 10 to five to ten dollars, not to mention the cost of um, the rental for the links machines on the businesses. So one transaction is being charged by the institution three and four times, and that is something that needs to be regulated. Um, on old age pensions, um, the laws, I think, need to, and policies need to be looked at in that as well for people applying for old age pension. Some people throughout their working life will have a nest egg and when these social workers come to do the interviews and stuff like that, and if these people have a nice home or a nice car, they will say, well, here, what, you can't qualify, which is a little bit unfair because some of these people are housewives who would have probably inherited things from their husbands, as well as some of them could have been sole traders who could not contribute to NIS pensions for themselves because our act does not allow sole traders to contribute to NIS. Um, we need to look at those things as well. Um, in manufacturing and trade, local manufacturing companies, due to our archaic laws, many of them has been establishing offices in other countries, such as Barbados, Guyana, Suriname, and Jamaica, in order to facilitate international trade. As a result, we lose Forex and most of our qualified professionals who would be qualified to do this, for example, the ECCA accountants and stuff like that, end up just working in other jobs that they're not supposed, well, I wouldn't say that they didn't design for. And it is just, um, so they end up in jobs that they're qualified for in lower 
paid circumstances. And the other countries, they are now benefiting with their work on human resource market. Whereas small and micro businesses are concerned, um, we should have a special list of importers, uh, special importers list uh, so that they could access lower custom charges and other tax, benefit, tax benefits so that their products wouldn't so their products could be sustainable and it wouldn't be as expensive and they could become more competitive as well. The bigger manufacturing companies enjoy many tax concessions that small and micro business owners don't have. For example, as well, our local artisans, our shoemakers, our designers, things like that, um, they should allow certain tax concessions for raw materials so that they could apply their trades in a cost-effective manner which would then lead to our economy being able to generate. And it doesn't be, when you say a small business, only be, um, should it be a store somebody should be able to open, but apply your trade. Our education system should also reflect that from primary, secondary school levels, people, children should be able to start engaging in trade. Not everybody is academically inclined to become attorneys and doctors and stuff like that. Um, and those things should go from primary, secondary school straight to tertiary level education. Because, I mean, from these things we could get great designers, Gucci, that kind of thing, they too, and have sustainable things. When we talk about revamping our economy, we need to look at things like that. Another area that must be addressed in Trinidad and Tobago is that of mental health, because it is something that is very important at every stage of life, from childhood to adolescence into adulthood. It affects our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. The way we think, feel, and act determines how we handle stress and relate to others and choices that we make. Therefore, this is something that should be mandatory and accessible from schools to workplaces, in our home for the aged, orphanages, and prisons, just to name a few. That being said as well, our education system, again, should look into areas that we need to allocate our human resources and guide our nation, children, and youths in the areas of studies rather than to have influxes and say, for example, the legal system and medical system only. Um, music and media legislation. Um, legislation must be put in place to regulate the type of music that comes through our airways and those that promote violence and stuff must be banned outright. Legislation should also be put in place to regulate and stop via the internet. Have some sort of filter for things like pornography and stuff is done in Singapore and the Middle Eastern countries, so it can be done here as well. Our country economy, that is one that is energy driven, and as a result, government should not have the opportunity to close down a state entity like what they did with Petrotrin without going to the public to have some sort of public re referendum. So going forward, all decisions, major decisions to do with the energy industry, Trinidad Trinidadians should have some sort of input on that. Like for example, with the Panama Canal, you can't just go there to make any changes to it without the people having something to, so we could look at that as a precedent and how to follow. Um, legalization to deal with policing and charging of suspects, suspects, sorry, digitalization and fingerprinting systems, digitalization of the R1 and R2A forms, and just to collect, and the collection of bio data is very tedious for police officers to go through these things so that charges are always very tedious and because some of these things sometimes it takes over a day, a day and a half just to process one person, police officers, because of the lack of resources and stuff. Sometimes they just don't charge people and then we want to know why it is we in the system that we are in. We need to have a centralized database linking all the different elements in the criminal justice system that when it is they want to put a charge, they don't have to put write one form ten times and stuff like that. Um, but um, you could yeah, it's just wrap up your up. points, please. Mm -hmm. um, housing should be 
something that is be done on a, a needs basis and not a political game for politicians. Um, we should have the true separation of powers and not what we see going on with our public officers recently. Um, the president and the speaker of both upper and lower houses respectively should not be politically appointed. And I have many more, but I will have to do it at some other point in time because it's a wrap up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for going through your points and making a contribution this evening. So do we have anyone else? So this will be an, an additional contribution, right? Yes. Once you're bringing a new, a new topic, yes. The topic on politics again. I personally believe, I've said it many, many times on all radio stations, that the manifesto should be a legal document binding to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, where they can take them to court if they fail to produce what they have said in that statement. Because any statement you make, sometimes they take you to court for it, and they win you. The politicians do it at their wins and fancy sense I know myself. And they tell you everything on the manifesto. They'll fix your road, give you water, get schools for you, get every single thing for you. And as they get into power there, or being in opposition, they forget every single thing. I have all, nearly all the manifestos home. And they would tell you everything they would do, and they never, never do it. So I personally think that is one thing should be priority, should be a legal document where they can take them to court and see what it is could be done. Or not. My next point is government departments. Take, for example, T and Tech. If you don't pay them in time, they cut you off. But you have NGC, also a government department. That is... Tier Tech is owing them, alleged, owing them millions of dollars. And they are not paying them. I think NGC should, be, should have the power to cut off Tier Tech also. Because they have people who take shares in NGC, which was like $25, $30, now with $6 and $7. I, I, I have shares with them, and it, it is true. I'm a pensioner now, 16 years. And I mean, it's unfair to me. But NGC could make money, but... The, the companies is taking their gas and not paying them, especially t and Tech. And if you owe them one single cent, they're ready to cut you off. My next point is the court system, which is a burning issue in Trinidad and Tobago. You'd have court matters going for 15, 16, up to even 20 years. Take, for example, Dana Sita Hall. Ten years now when the case ends start. When would it start? All those boys inside there would get away, sue the government, and get millions of dollars again as they are doing now. The judicial system is terribly wrong. I used to be around the judicial system, and I can tell you. The lawyer would be there, he would go to an next court, you retain him, and they would say, him, in an next court. Why he should be in an next court when you pay him to attend your business? He should be there. The policeman or the, or the inspector, whosoever, lay the charge against you, he's downstairs. And the prosecutor would say, he's out of court in the next district. I personally think the police, as they leave the service, should have a yearly diary. When I used to work in the service, I had a yearly diary also. So if you're in court, and the magistrate postpone your matter, you'll say, no, I'm, not, I'm unable to attend the court here today. And they put it for another day, which would be easy for everybody. But the judicial system, it doesn't work in at all. It is terrible, and it would never work. Because it's the same magistrate who sits there, he probably went to school with the, with the lawyer here, and everything is like that. Nothing is going on with that system at all. My last point, which I think is the most deadliest point in Trinidad and Tobago now, crime with children. And I personally think the government is responsible for that. People would not agree with me with that. When a man have a child with a woman, both of them should go and register this child birth. You have your ID card? Both of them. And if this child is 13 and 14 years and is delinquent, you get to the both parent. Both of them, mother and father, first. And if you get them, because sometimes this man have a child with this woman, 
this woman, our child with the other man, and, and so it goes on all the time, and nobody is responsible for these delinquent children. Government is responsible. You have the social development people, they're going about. If you have this child registered, and he's been there, and you know who is the parent and the delinquent, deal with the parent very, very seriously. And it will be time it reached the court, the parent would realize some men probably in good job, some women in good job, would not want their children to go across here. Because if you watch the crime rate in Trinidad now, is the youth, 13, 14, and 15 years. I thank you ever so much for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, sir. So we just have about 10 more minutes for this session, so I will invite two more contributions, either people who haven't made so far, or someone who would like to come and come back up and make a new point, make a new contribution, before we bring the session and this evening's consultation to an end. I just want to make an addition to a point that I had made earlier on as it regards to corrective action. Consequential management is what we need also to consider. Too many people in senior positions, they are either, I always term them either, we, well, of course, we have a group of what I call lazy managers. Managers who accept salaries but don't act out their part. They sit in an office, air conditioned, and if it is that the job calls for certain things to do, they don't do it, and then at the end, they, they, they put forward a report that has no basis in terms of because they're not on the job, they're, they're not following it. Lazy managers, consequential management. We have to kick in those two in our constitution as regards to getting things right, getting the governance right. Thank you. So I now invite anyone, final contribution for the evening. Just two minor statements, really. Um, state of emergencies, in all cases, should require a special majority in parliament. No president, when it comes to the abrogation of people's rights, no, no one individual, even if it is the president, should have the ability to declare a state of emergency. Um, you should have to go to the parliament, and you need a special majority. I mean, we have the case where a state of emergency was called to remove a sitting speaker of the house. That, that, that is ridiculous. Um, the Senate, could anybody tell me, other than giving nine independents a voice, or giving somebody that couldn't win an election a seat, what is the point of the Senate, really? I mean, maybe I understand that if you want to appoint a minister, they need to be a member of parliament. But that is something else that needs to be looked at, and I, I believe um, in the questionnaire, or was it, um, the, there was a document circulated that I answered, I believe it was the questionnaire talking about whether, um, um, I can't remember. <laughs> that the, anyways, besides the point, we need to look at revamping the Senate in some, some way. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for your contribution. Thank you very much, all our contributors, for joining us this evening and for those who made contributions to our head table. I would now like to invite Mr. Nizam Mohammed, attorney at law and former Speaker of the House, to deliver a vote of thanks. Mr. Mohammed. Thank you, moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a very pleasant experience coming to Kuva and to be interacting with you all in this rather critical exercise that we at the head table have been requested to undertake. 
before I express my thanks to you all, I just want to make just one or two remarks about our task and what we are about. At the very beginning of our constitution, it is called the preamble. And it starts off like this. Whereas the people of Trinidad and Tobago have affirmed that the nation of Trinidad and Tobago is founded upon principles that acknowledge the supremacy of God, faith in fundamental human rights and freedoms, the position of the family in society of free men and free institutions, the dignity of the human person, and this is the part, the equal and inalienable rights which, with which all members of the, few, of the human family are endowed by their creator. These, this is the first paragraph of the Constitution that has 143 sections. And that is how it begins. When I look at this document and I see the people of Trinidad and Tobago have affirmed that our nation is founded upon principles that, re that recognize and acknowledge the supremacy of God. And among other things, we recognize the equal and inalienable rights with, with which all members of the human family are endowed by their creator, I am being told as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago that this is something that recognizes this document, which is the foundation for the management of our society. It tells me that the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and it is the fundamental legal document as well, recognize certain rights that I have. And those rights have been given to me by my creator, inalienable rights. I say, with the firmest conviction that the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago is a sacred document. A sacred document. And every individual in our country should recognize that. In the same way this document recognizes our rights of religious beliefs or any other persuasion, in the same way we should recognize that this document is a sacred document. And it is founded upon a relationship between our supreme being and those of us human beings. Therefore, when I hear comments that are not in sync with what we are about, I think it becomes incumbent upon us to let you know that what we are doing 
is something that is so critically important for the benefit of our nation and our country. And it starts up, this same piece that I have read, it says, whereas the people of Trinidad and Tobago, in the Constitution of the United States of America, which I think is only three pages, eh? it starts up like this, we the people, not whereas the people of the United States of America, we the people. You know why I make that distinction? We at the head table, we are at one with an understanding that it is the people of Trinidad and Tobago who should produce an amended or a new constitution and no political party. It will not work. It cannot be partisan. And anyone who looks at this head table and says this is a political gimmick and that kind of thing, it is so unfortunate. It shows such a fundamental misunderstanding of what this document is, the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. My friends, when last have we gathered as a people, just as a people from our community, to talk about our problems and our challenges and our condition without some kind of political bias. It is so difficult for our people to see that we have to do what Lloyd Best used to be telling us years ago. He says, he called upon this country, he says it's time that we take up our bed and walk. That is what independence is all about. We are not governed from the United Kingdom anymore. We are on our own. And this is a process. The purpose of our chairman and um, my colleague, Dr. Farrell, making opening remarks is to lay out and prepare us for the kind of discussion that we have come to engage ourselves in. That was the purpose. And Dr. Farrell has told us we have had so many attempts. And this one is going to be the fifth. And I, he mentioned that we, and our chairman rather, says we are not writing a con um, or amending or producing a constitution. We are preparing, doing the groundwork for a national assembly where it is going to be non-political, save and accept the government of the day has to facilitate the process. That is what we put them for. That is the system of, of governance that we operate in Trinidad and Tobago. And they have a responsibility to facilitate this process. And we intend, and we have succeeded so far, to keep this entire process independent and, uh, independent and pure and clean for and on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and no organization or no one else or no institution. We are doing this for ourselves and our people for and on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And if we succeed at, on the fifth attempt, all I am saying is, I, my dream is that that document, when you open it, it will start with we the people, meaning you and me, all of us, regardless. So brothers and sisters, I hope you understand the perspectives and you understand where we are coming from. I, speaking for myself, I speak on behalf of my colleagues, we want Trinidad and Tobago to get totally engaged in this exercise 
all of us without exception. And no matter what you do, we have freedoms, and one of the freedom is for people to sabotage, but I think that the majority of the people in Trinidad and Tobago, the majority is understanding that there is another political ideology that is challenging our way of life as is contained in this constitution. And their ideology is based on guns and violence and bloodshed and mashing up everything. Total destruction. And your presence tonight is indicative of the fact that you are standing up against that. You want a fair and a just society in Trinidad and Tobago. You love your country and you are trying to assist in seeing that things are put right. And that is what all of us are doing. So I want to thank you all for your contributions. Everyone has been, every contribution has been very valuable. There is a process. Everything has been recorded and we continue towards the end of June when we hope that we'd be able to put this assembly together and we move on from there. I want to wish all of you, I want to thank our moderator and I want to um, thank all of you for coming and making the contributions that you have made. And I wish all of us, as all of us, a safe journey to our respective homes. A very good night to each and every one of you. God bless. Thank you very much, Mr. Nizam Mohammed, for your vote of thanks. So as we end, a heartfelt thank you to members of the public from Hoover and beyond for attending tonight and your valuable contributions. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. And we thank as well the members of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform for hosting this discussion, this town hall meeting here at Lisa's Gardens in Hoover. Please note, two consultations are scheduled, but for young people in the next couple of days, there's one on Saturday, the 11th of May at 9.30 a.m. at the Cabildo building on St. Vincent Street. And there's one in Tobago, Tobago Youth Forum, next Tuesday, May 14th at Shaw Park at 5. So maybe you could pass on that message to some of the young persons who you may be in contact with and have influence over. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and we invite you to share in some light refreshments, and please get home safely. Good evening.